Welcome again to another week of the legendary Snap No Tap podcast. I'm Tony Cicchini. And of course, the world's best looking man, Joe Cardinal. He's always here. He never goes away, uh, except when he's posing for statues and art galleries and so on. But um, yeah, we have a couple of special guests. We have a returning great martial artist, as you know, uh, Melody uh, Jeter, who's been on before and who I've trained and worked with. And she trains under one of my students, Jason Bender, and actually we'll be doing a seminar at Bender's Martial Arts and Fitness, uh, what is it, the 15th, couple weeks, mm -hmm. uh, and then the next day in Downers Grove uh, with the crowd Maga, so I can beat up on people for two days in a row. But as most of you know that have been following me for 100 years that I've been online, I'm a, my love besides fighting is jazz music, drums but especially jazz accordion. And I, I've been lucky to study with two of the best players ever and met a lot of great guys. And today we finally are entering really into my world outside of my fighting related shit. And that is the world of jazz accordion. And I'm gonna tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, we have no one finer available. This guy is the top of the, the heap. He's the uh, Mike Tyson. He's the, you know, he's the champ of the champs, a, a world champion, uh, accordionist, and also a world champion person, just a wonderful guy. And um, his name is Corey Pesaturo. Welcome to the podcast, Corey. It's an honor, honest to God. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Especially you're talking Chicago. I'm trying to be the, the Michael Jordan of accordion, but yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know. In Chicago, we like to say you're the Joe Cardinal of accordion, but. <laughs> oh, okay then. And I'm, I'm from New England, so I'll try to be the Tom Brady of accordion, but we'll go from there. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Don't mention Tom. Well, you know, he's got. Ah! Right. No, but Joe's a, Joe is a great interviewer and I kind of, and Melody's a musician as well. That's why we're having Melody on. She's a pianist. Um, and those, there's two types of people, you know, those who play piano and those who wish they could play the accordion. Um, <laughs> Melody plays the piano. I mean, she can't play the accordion. I missed out. Well, you, you missed out by not listening. You got to hear this guy play one of these days. Uh, he's phenomenal. I Joe, have why don't you take over? Joe, you're great with the questions and if I can kick in with the technical shit okay well i mean actually this is the time where i actually reason melody's here is i was like oh, oh i better phone a friend because uh <laughs> i'm definitely out of my i'm out of my depth here this is a world-class musician you know when you guys so we had a, a previous phone call just kind of setting these things up and i gotta just say how personable Corey was i mean here's a international superstar and, and we're just a couple of guys running an amateur podcast here who love the accordion and love jazz and he was just so ready to go like let's talk and we talked for like i don't know what was it like you know probably at least an hour we had like a separate <laughs> podcast that we didn't record yeah but i basically let you two guys run because it was so over my head with music theory and history i was just, i have nothing to add to this conversation you know except <laughs> so um but yeah i mean Corey, you know for the uninitiated so and I, part of the, i just want to say um that this is exciting because tony's always making musical references and tying it in with you know we're martial arts focused but this is the first time we're, we're kind of adding a new dimension to the show we want to really just have music focused shows because so many of the people we talk to have musical interests too um and obviously you're a very niche part of the musical world 
um, with the accordion. And that's why it's so perfect. For, this is like, you're, you're the perfect person to kick this part off for us, you know, like, and in some ways I'm still a little bit in shock. It's like, well, Hey, we should start doing musical ones. Why don't we get the world's greatest accordionist on? Sure. <laughs> right. you know, I think we'll get Barack Obama next week. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep, you know, we just stop. We need to start asking bigger people because clearly uh, you've set a precedent here. Where they'll say, if you don't ask the answer is always no. Right. Exactly. Yeah, there you go. But I mean, just, I mean, for those who, you know, obviously Corey, people out there, look out, he's got tons of stuff on YouTube, great videos that I've spent some time looking at. So I, I know a little bit about your background, but just start off at the beginning, you know, how did growing up, how did you get introduced into music? Were you in a musical household? Uh, you know, give us some, some background. Tell us how you got into this. So my background is, is very much, it sounds like a story out of the fifties. Uh, and that would be that I only played because my dad played and being in an Italian family, he asked, do you want to play accordion? Uh, and I didn't want to disappoint him. So I said, okay. Uh, and, and his background is he played when the accordion was popular, then quit when it wasn't popular because you couldn't get a date or get a gig if you played <laughs> accordion by 1967. And, and that was, that was the, especially by the seventies, it was over. So, but he took it out again when I was nine and nine and a half asked if I wanted to play. And I said, yes, um, I didn't like playing at all, but I was always, and I always have been a very competitive person and I sucked at sports. I was terrible at sports. I still watch all sports religiously, uh, especially being from Boston. It kind of is a religion over there, uh, but I'm a huge racing guy. I can talk Formula One and MotoGP more than I can talk music, but I was never good at sports. And when I realized within a couple of weeks, ooh, I'm good at this music thing. Mm -hmm. I So I went into music specifically for competitive reasons. And that didn't change through when I won the national championship when I was 15 years old. I still mainly did it because I was good at it. And I realized I could have a career at it. Um, and it wasn't until I found jazz at 17, 17 and a half years old that I finally said, ooh, I'm liking this music thing now because I always improvised, but I always got in trouble for improvising, huh. right? Your teacher's like, you can't do that. No, it's not the music. So <laughs> I always improvise. Then I found jazz and I'm like, wait a minute, you're supposed to improvise. And I actually learned jazz on the clarinet before I learned it on accordion because my clarinet teacher in Rhode Island was the best jazz clarinetist in, in the region. And if I had a good lesson, he would pull out the real book and I would be allowed to play a jazz tune at the end of my lesson. So I actually started playing jazz on clarinet before I played on accordion. And then when I went to New England Conservatory and I got in there really just because I was able to play different styles of music, I, I didn't play jazz yet. That's when I really started divulging into jazz because all the jazz students at NEC were some of the best jazz cats in the world. So I was so far behind, but I had that, you know, I had that upbringing where I was able to be around them 24 seven and constantly learn. And who's that name? And whether you're at lunch, at dinner, hanging out, walking somewhere at a party, I was constantly asking questions. Who is Bill Evans? You know, what, who is Art Tatum? Who are these people? And, and I was able to learn it from there. So I didn't really love music until I found jazz. I liked it, but I didn't love it. Um, and, that, and that's kind of, that, that's kind of the, the chapter one and two and three or so of, of my accordion upbringing. That's really, well, you know, let me, let me add in here that um, uh, the people that are following this, Corey had briefly mentioned, and I want him to delve into this. He said something until he won the national championship. Well, what, what a lot of people don't know, like in the fighting game, you know, we have our state, you know, local, state, regionals, nationals, internationals, world championships. You have it in music um, in, in, in various instruments, but we have it in the accordion. Now, Corey um, entered for classical. Let's talk about that national uh, title first, and then we can work our way up to how you ended up winning world titles in, in <laughs> digital and jazz. Well, see, uh, like you said, and you know this, in the accord, the accordion world is uh, always very tied to the competitions, as the piano is, the violin is, the cello is, really all of them are. Um, but I, of course, you do a classical. That's what you have to do. So when I won that national championship, I think I played uh, Concert Stuck by Von Weber. I played uh, Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto, or I might have played actually the Violin Concerto. I did both at different times. And... <laughs> you know, very strict and very difficult kind of classical music that, that we put on accordion. Accordionists love Tchaikovsky. We're always transcribing Tchaikovsky and putting it on, on accordion. That's, that's a very big thing. Um, and I went to the world championships because when you win the national, of course, then you can go to the worlds. I knew 
uh, at 15, I was going to get absolutely decimated. And I was fine with that. I just wanted to go and see how well do people in Russia and China and Eastern Europe play the accordion. And it was certainly eye opening for me because it was, you know, it's just <laughs> it's completely different level. Um, but that was never my goal. My goal was to win the national championship and then go off and learn all genres of music and become the most versatile accordionist I could be. And that's what I really did at, at NEC. But yeah, it was very much uh, all classically based and, and you couldn't improvise, of course, <laughs> that'd be, that'd be illegal. Um, but that I retired, I'm, I'm really the Brett Favre of accordion. I've retired like four times. So that was my <laughs> first time in retiring. I said, okay, I'm done. I did my goal. Now let me go off and learn as much music as I can. So I can go out and play lots of gigs. Uh, so I don't know where you want to go from there and, and uh, to the worlds, of course. Yeah, but you know, no, there is now again, th this is a great tie in once to, to self defense and to fighting because a lot of people, and I talk about this, Corey, on the, on the podcast every week, and I've been doing it for years, how there is a difference between sport competition and real world self defense. Okay. And many sportsmen are truly, they're good at it, they win titles. They're not prepared for real world self-defense, a whole different world. You pretty much said the same thing where, yes, you won this national title in classical music, but man, are you going to go play a gig? Are you ready for the real world? You know, and, and, <laughs> and I'm not singling you out, but that's just the thing. If you, because for people who don't know, he was mentioned, he, he practiced Tchaikovsky and country stuck and all that. This is probably all you did, right? I mean, you were practicing. No, 100%. You, yeah. you took a whole nine months or more to learn these pieces. That's all you practiced. Uh, of course, I was always learning Italian music on the side and some old Americana, peg of my heart, you know, yeah. kind of tunes as well. Watching Lawrence Welk with my grandparents, <laughs> of course. So, um, you know, at 7 p.m., football was shut off, even if there was one minute left in the game. It was Lawrence Welk time. <laughs> so, so, of course, I learned all that stuff. And, but yeah, you're right. 95% of your time was focused on the competition of the next year. And that was never hundred percent my, my goal of everything, because as I said, I, I knew I could never be the best accordion player in the world. You're not going to beat Russians that practice eight hours a day and live with their teacher. You're not going to beat them. So I saw another goal of, can I be the most versatile player in the world um, and, and be a great improviser? That was always kind of my, my push, but I, I wanted to be, you know, the guy that brought the accordion back and be respected in the normal, you know, world of common people like Dick and Tino. I wanted to be Dick, but I also wanted to be respected in the actual music and accordion world like Charles Mignanti was. I, I wanted to do both and, and try to be respected in both worlds. Uh, and that was kind of the goal. But when you when you go towards, so, I mean, I never thought of that, that there is a tie in of maybe guys that are amazing at boxing. If you went to fight them on the street, you'd actually be able to beat them because they aren't good at street fighting You're compared right. to the difference of actually being in the ring. It's, it is totally different skills. In the same way, I attack classical musicians all the time because they, they if you just say at the end of the tune, at the last two measures, we just go up a whole step or can we just change the end to where you just do a fermata? They can't do it. They yeah. can't. They, they don't know what key they're in. They're and, and I don't blame <laughs> them. I blame the teaching of classical music, that they don't teach music theory and they don't teach all these other things. The skills you actually need to jump on stage, as I just did 10 minutes ago, playing the national anthem, uh, the Italian national anthem with a soprano. We've never met. We had five minutes because I just got here in time and she wanted to do it in a key I've never played it in. It's my job to be able to know a song and change key without practice. And at the very end, she kind of screwed up something and I had to add two beats to the very end of it. <laughs> but that's my job as a professional to be able to do that. But a classical musician could never be able to change key and then change the ending. And those are the skills that need to be taught because in the real world, that's so vital. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's a whole other discussion on things. To go to the world championships, Again, I never had an interest, so I retired number one at 15. Then I went into college. I'm learning all this stuff. And then near the end of college, uh, I was doing stuff with Roland, who makes the, the made, doesn't really make them more, the electric accordions, the, the only ones that really are around. And they said, Corey, they're going to have a new world championship in digital. This is more your style because it's not about who plays the best. It's who uses the accordion the best, which, of course, would mean you have to be versatile. If you're going to show off all the sounds in the electric accordion. You have to be versatile. And that's more up my wheelhouse. 
I'm still like, yeah, but I'm not interested in doing these comedy with these judges that decide, oh, I, his playing was better. And they said, well, it's going to be in New Zealand. And I went, oh, sign me up. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to actually, they had to do this quick competition where I had to win kind of almost a fake digital competition where I had to get a high enough score in my, in my presentation to win a would be national digital category. There was no one else that was good enough to even compete in it. So I passed that. And then we, I went to New Zealand and I won that. So then I retired the second time. <laughs> and then they, then someone had come up with a world jazz accordion competition. I said, well, I know I could win that. Cause at this point I had, I had already recorded a jazz album. I had become at least baby level jazz as I would call it. I mean, it takes a hundred years to get good at jazz for God's sakes. So I was, I could at least record with top musicians and play gigs all over. So I went, I won that. So then I retired for a third time. And, and then when people would start advertising, you know, world champion Corey Pesaturo, the accordion world didn't like this. They were like, well, he's never, he doesn't even play acoustic. He, he can't play and compete with these, these world championship acoustic players that play classical music. And of course, I'm Italian. That pissed me off. You tell yeah. someone I can't do something. It's like, oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So I went and found the great Gandalf, if I use the Lord of the Rings term here, of, of the accordion world, Steve Domenko. And Steve oh. Domenko is probably the greatest classical accordion player ever. He had long stopped playing accordion, uh, but he was very famous in the 60s after he won. He was the youngest world championship. He won the world championship at 17. It's unimaginable. It's still not beaten. I don't think it'll ever be beaten because he won in, in an era when uh, there was so many amazing accordion players uh, all around the world, especially just in the country. And I found him. He was like a, a hermit living in a little house in New Hampshire. And I would go up to him every month or two and learn everything I could from him. And I entered the acoustic world championship in Finland where they have it on national TV. It's like, you know, tonight American idol and at 9 PM on Fox, the world accordion championships that would never happen in America, but in Finland, the accordion's huge. So they have it there. They had eight contestants every year, national champions of their country. They had never once had an American because there wasn't anybody good enough. So I went there and I won that because it was, you get a band. So I said, wait a minute, I, I wrote out the arrangements. So I had done that. So I wrote out all the arrangements of the band. I made it versatile and I made it jazz based because it was different rounds. The first round I did jazz. The second round I did all different music from around the world. We did. So um, I made a mix and, and that's all on YouTube. That whole competition, you can see it on YouTube. Um, and I and I won that. So then I retired for the fourth time. I have stayed retired since then. Now I have judged world championships, so I obviously can't compete anymore. But that's kind of how the world championships came about. They were all just random events that happened. But I wasn't that was never the aim on any of three of those. It was other people came to me and said, you know, this exists. You know, this exists. The third one was was, oh, Corey can't win that. I was like, oh, really? Mm. OK, so. And I don't really play acoustic. I, I, I rarely do, but I, I can still say I have a world championship in acoustic. So it's like, I can't play it. That, you know, it's again, phenomenal. This Steven Domingo that he's talking about um, was so good sometime in the late sixties, the, the legendary Elmer Bernstein put on a concert where he had the, something like the youth of America. Now, People need to look up Bernstein. Uh, it wasn't Elmer Bernstein. I'm sorry. It was Leonard Bernstein. Elmer was a, uh, he did uh, Hollywood stuff, but Leonard was the king of the kings. And Stephen Domingo was part of this. He performed, he soloed for an accordion to be accepted. You, you know, what, what's that? You're breaking up, Corey. We can't, we can't hear you. It's, uh, testing, testing, testing. Yes. Yeah. We're okay. No, I, I said, when I said Steve Domingo, you actually knew who I was talking about. Hey, you're talking to an Italian over here, huh? <laughs> Come on. You knew who but, I was talking. Very good. Of course. Well, this this is for the people that are watching that don't know this world. Corey, he seeked out, you know, a legend in our in, in the classical world of accordion. I'm a jazz player. I'm not part of the classical world, but of course I know all the great or knew all, all the greats. Stephen Domenico ranks at the top. There was a few. Um, another one named William Cosby, you know. Bill Cosby, but not the Bill Cosby. Right. So I, I became very good friends with Bill Cosby for the last 10 years of his life because he was playing as well as he'd ever played. Uh, he went to West Point. I mean, he had an amazing career, an amazing life, but he died of cancer. So sad. But him and him and Steve Domenico were close buddies. They were both, you know, same level of ridiculous ability. 
Well, that's great on your part. I did not know that you studied with him. Um, it, 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 so people that are listening or, or watching, there's such a tie-in when, like when people come to train with me, they'll come from wherever. They're making their search. Corey made his search. I made my searches through my life, both musically and, you know, fighting related. Uh, so I, I guess the point to be taken here is you're never good enough where you can't get better and you, and oh, you God, stop no. learning. You I, stop I always learning. say, if you think you're good, you're done. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Melody, what do you have to say about this? Besides looking beautiful as always. Um, thank you, Tony. No, it's funny um, bringing those two worlds together, the fighting world and the music world. So I, I played the piano. I was you know, taught classical and only classical. It was very funny to listen to you, Corey, talking about the difference between classical and, and you know, discovering improvisation and getting excited about that. Cause I was just like, oh God, no, don't, don't take me out that, you know, out there be dragons. Um, I love <laughs> jazz. I love listening to jazz. I have huge respect for it. It's on my turntable a lot, but to play it is a whole other level. And it's funny because when I think about fighting, which is what I do with these guys, it's very interesting to me because in my mind, it definitely relates to music and how we learn music and how my coach, Jason, who's, who's um, a buddy of these guys, has said to me on more than one occasion when I very first started was, wow, you don't know how to improvise, do you? <laughs> because you have to... You know, in fighting, much like in music, you have to know your basics before you can improvise, before you get to that point where you can go play, right? You've got to, you've got to have put the work in. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting to me. My question is, or one of the questions I have is, as a jazz musician, you know, you're, like you said, you're not, you're classically trained, but you've also gone to conservatory and then you've done the gigs. Like, where do you feel like, the greatest teaching happened in your life? Was it gigging or was it more structured or both, I guess? I mean, you need all of it, obviously. Um, and and this, like you just said, all the great jazz musicians in, in history, especially the pianists, when we're talking about them, they were all top classical pianists before they moved right. on to jazz. Because, and I, I just have a, uh, made a TED talk, it should be up live in the next couple of days even and i and i went over that there are three distinct categories of musicians and and nobody talks about this enough i i feel like everybody realizes it but they don't think of it like this you have technique you have the brain and you have the ear mm. and and they all must be of the same level if, if you are to function correctly um and and the thing is every type of musician whether you're an eastern european balkan musician you're a jazz musician you're a classical musician you all have different skill sets in these three where classical musicians focus on the technique so they can play anything but the teaching of classical never teaches anything about the brain which is the theory and the analytics mm -hmm. and a lot of times they lack in the ear which the ear is your creativity because they listen to, they listen to a lot of stuff but maybe they, it's not the creative is more than the theory but that you know that could be a problem jazz musicians problem is a lot of time they spend way too much time on the brain so they can tell you, oh, over this chord, you can play this scale. And with this scale, you can play this chord. And then you can do this cool, like, look at this cool trick. And then with these chords and these chords. But they don't think enough creatively. They're just thinking mechanically, I can do this cool stuff. But it's not, sometimes it loses the creative aspect. And they don't focus enough on the technique because they just want to play all their cool stuff. So, and they, maybe their tech and they, and they hear cooler stuff that they can play because they didn't spend those years early learning the hard Bach and technical stuff. You right. need all three to work in harmony to, to really be of the, and you know, very few people have really achieved that. The Keith Jarrett's of the world, the, the Art Tatum's of the world, the Winton Marsalis's of the world. These people, the Jacob Collier's of the world, these people have all three, 10 out of 10. Uh, and that's what you want to uh, aspire to. And, and I think different people in different categories of music, I, they get fixated on one of the three or maybe two of the three, and they're not working on, on all three. But yeah, I was luckily, you know, forced into learning all that hard classical stuff at an early age, even though I didn't love to always do it. But you need that. So now I can play Cherokee comfortably at 400 beats a minute with no problem yeah. because I have the technique from the classical world. Um, but but if you only know the theory and you have the technique, you may hear all this cool stuff you could play at 400 beats per minute, but you can't physically play it 
because maybe you didn't do that hard practice early on. So, but but in, in your question, what helped the most? Oh, the, still the most is listening and playing with other people, which is, should be a motivating factor to young people that as much as you don't want to sit down and study theory, you don't want to sit down in a class and listen to a teacher, you don't want to sit down and practice these hard scales, it should be a motivating factor that the things you learn the most are when you're just having fun playing with other people and sitting down listening. That's where you learn the most, but you need those other things to put it all together. But that is certainly the most is, is go play with people who are better than you. Always hire people who are better than you and get your butt kicked. That's the only way you're going to get better. That's the same for fighting, right guys? Yeah. Don't oh yeah, it's oh, gotta yeah. be, it has to be. Yeah. Well, yeah. I got a, I got a message for Corey. So uh, I'm, I, it's on my phone. I don't want to screw the guy's name up, but anyway, I have just become internet friends with a guy name. Well, I'm going to get, his name is Tom, but let's get all the last names right here. Tom Fiella, but this ties you in Corey because Tom Fiella went to school with a guy that played bass with you named Marty Ballou. Or Balu? Marty Ballou is one of the best bass players in New England. He is one of the best. Very good know. friend of mine. Yeah. Well, I'm saying a shout out to Tom. I, I've been working with him a little bit, just showing him some jazz theory. He's, uh, you know, he doesn't play jazz yet, but he's going to be a jazz. <laughs> so watch out, Corey. Uh, he's coming for you. But no, but yeah, when he said, oh, I know my, my friend played bass. I said, well, I'm going to mention it on the, uh, on the podcast. Which is an interesting thing because I went to hear the legendary Frank Darone, who passed away sadly, phenomenal monster guitarist and vocalist. Um, matter of fact, Frank Sinatra once said that um, Frank Darone was the best singer he ever heard. But when I went to talk to Frank Darone, I think we lost Corey, and this sucks because this ties into Corey. Um, Frank was shocked that I understood jazz as a drummer. I said, Well, I was an accordion player, I studied jazz accordion. And come to find out, Frank Darone went and performed the high school, what do you call it, talent show with, with the legendary Angelo DePippo. And Corey, you know Angelo. I knew Angelo. I mean, there's a guy who can play classical. Well, when he was in his you know peak, classical and jazz, man, unbelievable. Angelo, Angelo's technique is so good that I can <laughs> hear two notes, just two, but up, and I know it's, it's Angelo's playing. It's like, I call him the machine gun. He sounds like a machine gun. His technique is ridiculous. It, well, um, it, I, I knew a guy from Chicago. He passed away, Lindy K.O. I'll make this sto story real, real short. Lindy kind of pulled the rug out from under Angelo and bought this bell accordion that Angelo wanted to buy. But uh, uh, Lindy went to New York and picked it up and goes to Angelo's house, you know, to show off the accordion and, now, Lindy, by the way, was a sensational musician, trumpeter, accordionist, did, was a WGN studio musician back in the day, did correspondence courses with the Berkeley College, uh, Berkeley School of Music. He knew everything. And he said, Angelo was just doing some scales. And I said to Lindy, what scales was he doing? He's like, I don't know. They were too fast. <laughs> that was exactly what he said. I don't know. They were too fast. Yeah, that's how much no. technique Angelo de Pippo has. Oh yeah, ridiculous. I mean, and he uh, his perpetual motion, which is like you know the the five minute song of nonstop eighth notes, you know, just perfect, zero mistakes. And I know he did it without overdubbing it. I mean, that's just that's just Angelo. Um, so, <laughs> and he was from my home state of. Rhode Island, because his father had a music store on Federal Hill, where all the Italians still are, way back in the 30s and 40s. Well, this guy, Tom Fiella, he's originally from uh, Providence, Rhode Island, or Rhode Island, I shouldn't say Providence. So yeah, there's like these tie-ins. But you know, when when I mentioned that you were going to be on the podcast, he's like, oh, yeah, my friend played with him, you know, uh, it, it really is a small world. But I've played again, with Marty many times, many, many times. Yeah, see, I'm not familiar with him because, you know, I, I haven't been out east in a long time, but I, I might be going to New Hampshire um, next year sometime. So if you're around, you know, New Hampshire small, I can drive up to Rhode Island or wherever you're at. Um, but, you know, the thing is, there is some, I try to tell people the similarities between fighting. For me, I started 
fighting before I started music. But once I got into the jazz, it just enhanced my fighting because learning how to improvise. And like Corey said, with the ear and how to think and putting it all together and the tie in with the technique, that's what your fight training is all about. You've got to learn your basic fundamentals, your stance, your footwork, your movement. Quit trying to learn all these flashy, fancy submissions. You're not going to be able to pull them off because you don't have the foundation. But once you have that foundation, learning other stuff is just a matter of being exposed to it, letting it sink in, and making that mind-body connection. That's what jazz guys do. I mean, uh, you know, you've done it, Corey. You've gigged. I used to gig through the years, especially on the drums with a lot of guys. You, you pick up shit just from listening to the other cats in the band. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's still the best way to learn is, uh, you know, playing with people. And then I, of course, today it's so easy with YouTube in that you can slow down anything. Um, and I, and I felt once a lot of stuff got on YouTube by 2009, 10, 11, I said, you're going to start seeing really good jazz musicians by 16, 17, where before, you know, really, it'd be amazing if you saw great jazz musicians by 2021, 20, 22, that was amazing. I yeah. said, now with YouTube, you're going to start seeing it at 16, 17, maybe even 15. And that's happening now. I'm seeing a lot of that because you can, you can learn, you know, it's, it's, it, there's always a thing you see the five-year-old Asian kid play Mozart perfectly. And as amazing as it is, you, if you get some real savant kid, you can always teach him, here's the notes, here's how to play it, and you're going to get that. But to play jazz at 10 or 11, 12, that's like, that's a whole other thing. Uh, and, and you're seeing that a little bit more. And, and I think it's because of, again, with YouTube and so much on there. And you can slow it down and transcribe it. And you got your keyboard right there and you can play it. You couldn't do that. You know, 30 years ago, you had to get the record and go back and go back and go like, I think, uh, I think I got, it took so long, but, but at least playing with people, you might be able to ask them that lick you played like at this court, show, what was that? And they might tell you, and then, you know, you learn that. Okay. But it's playing with people. And as I said, ideally people that are better than you, uh, that can kick your butt. You know, on this youth thing, the, the the best young kid I ever heard, he was I at when he was 12. He played piano. And I I, I haven't followed his career because he's got to be in his 30s now, but his name was Sergio Battistelli, I think. Um mm. from I don't know if he was from Italy, I think he was from Brazil or whatever, but he was playing like really pretty damn good jazz on a piano at 12. And like like you said, Corey, that blew my mind because that's rare to have that kind of maturity on you know, for jazz. Um, yeah. Now I'm a Joey assuming... Alexander is the guy today that I played with him at 10 and he was already playing any tune trading. I mean, it, it, alien. And he didn't know where it came from. Maybe who, he said, well, how do you know how to do this? <laughs> Joey What's Alexander. It? Oh no, I never, I haven't heard of him. Oh, you got to check him out. It, actually he has a blue solo that he played with at the Lincoln center. That might be my favorite blue solo I've ever heard anyone do. Uh, and he just, he doesn't know where it came from. He, he and his dad to say, I don't know where it came from. I'm an okay guitar player. Uh, some people are just blessed with these crazy abilities. Um, but but you're you're definitely seeing like people that don't have all like I have a great ear, but I don't have the tape recording ability. I don't have perfect pitch. There's other born with abilities I don't have. But you know, with a great ear, you can do something. But you're seeing that at a lower and lower level, a lower lower age, where people are getting to these crazy good levels. Uh, that didn't seem possible 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, but I, I can't believe the tie-ins, just listening to you guys talk about boxing and martial arts, that there are so many tie-ins from being a musician and accordion <laughs> player to boxing. I never thought there'd be this many tie-ins. Well, well I would say, Tony, don't you agree that just everything we was talking about, the people getting younger and younger and having access to so much can get them to a higher level of mus uh, musicianship faster. We see the same in, in fighting, you know, or at least within the sport world of fighting, which I know Tony frowns upon a little bit, but it's true. We'll sh we're seeing younger and younger world champions because they have access. I, th I think because they have access to more and more, you know, information. They have the internet and they have access to all the greatest teachers ever with a single click and it's it's kind of cool um it can also completely derail you if you don't have a good coach you know if you don't have someone 
who's in your world, helping yeah. you figure out what path to take when you're young, I think. But by the same token, you know, I can take a, you know, personal lesson, if you will, with almost with some of the greatest coaches coaching today by just jumping onto YouTube, which is kind of cool. Well, as long as you're following the right guy, there's a lot of junk on YouTube too. There just is. like there's horrible sure. musicians on YouTube. You yeah. Know? But I got to tell you this. YouTube. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, Curry, now, now, without getting too personal, because I don't want, you know, anything to make you uncomfortable, but would you mind sharing what, what, what inspires you? Because people always will say, well, you know, the guy's Corey's so great. It's, you know, it's a joke to him, but you've got to be inspired. Something's motivating you still. I mean, uh, there, the, it's funny because I always say, you know, in the accordion world is one thing, but as a musician, it's so easy to stay humble because yeah. all you need to do is hear one solo by Keith Jarrett or one track of Art Tatum or, or you know, one arrangement by Jacob Collier. And you're like, I suck. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to stay humble as a musician. Um, so it's always funny when I see different people that get, you know, that have this ego about things. Um, and it just like, I don't know how you could possibly have an ego as a musician. I can see being, you know, cocky and ego are very different. I can see being cocky about if, if you feel you're really good and someone's like, oh, I think that guy's better. I can see you standing up for yourself. But having, truly having an ego, it's like, there's, you know, there's so many ridiculously good musicians out there that all you have to do is go on YouTube for five minutes and be like, wow, I am terrible. You know, it's, it's so easy. So, um, and, and especially like another thing the internet has opened up for the accordion world is the Eastern European Balkan world. Most of the best accordionists in the world are from Bulgaria, Macedonia, uh, Moldova, Romania, Hungary, they, all, all these, Serbia, all these areas. And before the internet, we had no idea they existed. We had no idea. Mm. And they're the best. I'm sorry. They're absolutely the best because they're almost as good as the Russians on classical technique, but they can play anything in any meter and improvise. And they put ornaments. It's like, so it's great that the internet has opened that up. And it makes you realize you're like, I'm close to the top of the mountain. I say, oh crap, the mountain's up here. Ah, crap. You know, so it's it's there's always a higher, you know, mountain to go to. So um, and it's the same, not to bring up Tom Brady, but after every single game, no matter how good he is, he'll talk about where he sucked and where he can improve on. And oh, this throw is terrible, and I miss this guy. And you could always get better. And, and for me, probably the, the highest inspiration would be Art Tatum. I think he, if I had to pick the greatest musician of all time, I'd pick him uh, in terms of where he was in comparison to where music was and how far ahead of where he was. In the same way in the car world, we see the McLaren F1 as maybe the greatest car of all time because of where technology was and where the McLaren was when it came out in 1992. And the gap was just that big. So. You know, this uh, you can always get in inspired. It's so easy. It's like if you're not getting inspired, then you might need to check your ego. <laughs> That's very well put. Yeah, uh, yeah. Art Tatum, the, the the and the true story of of Oscar Peterson being, I mean, a, a legend. Oh my God! Well, yeah, you've seen yeah. that interview. Yeah. I mean, he was my favorite growing up, Oscar Peterson, because he did it all: block cores, yeah. everything. He could he could do anything. Yep. But when yep. you know, oh, I I quit. I cried when I heard friggin' uh. Yeah, uh, Art Tatum. It, he, you know, <laughs> that's the truth. Because there's something similar happened to me. Not that I was as good as Oscar Peterson, but when I was like 13. All right, I gotta tell you this. So I was raised basically worshiping Gene Krupa as a drummer. Okay, oh, mm -hmm. Gene Krupa's the greatest drummer. I was a Gene Krupa fanatic. So um, I was 13 years old or 14, and no, 13. And Buddy Rich came to Cleveland. That's what I was born to raise. I, I knew you were going to gonna say Buddy Rich. Oh, yeah. So I went with this kid, Nick, and his mother and my grandfather. We went downtown. We got to see Buddy Rich. And I literally, during the thing, I started crying. When I got home, I got rid of all my Gene Krupa albums. I said, forget it. Buddy is now un unapproachable, man. So Buddy, I had a Buddy Rich, like a like Oscar Peterson had that thing with uh, Art Tatum. I had my Buddy Rich moment where I'm like, it can't be done. <laughs> this can't be done. I just saw the guy do it, but it can't be done. It's a trick. He's too good. So Corey's talking about these Bulgarians in Eastern Bloc, and believe me, I've seen them on uh, YouTube as well. 
they're remarkable almost to the point where it becomes you get dis disenfranchised from it you get detached because it's like alien to you it's like well <laughs> now i can't i can't go there it's a little too much for me i can't relate but it's amazing what happens in a culture where they have no barely any television not much technology and nothing to do all day when they just say well i, I guess i better become a really good musician but the bar is so high because they say if you want to become a violinist, a clarinetist, or accordionist out there, you have to be, or, or um, hammer dulcimer, you have to be of this level or you aren't going to get gigs. So yeah. if they're going to go in that path, they have to go that high. Where in America, I mean, most of the famous people of the past 60 years play three, four chord music and have gotten wildly popular, whether it's Taylor Swift or Beyonce or something. It's like, you don't have to really know that much to make a hundred million dollars a year in music, but if you want to have gigs and play wedding gigs in Romania, you have to be this ridiculously good or you're not going to get hired. And that's how high the bar is. And, and because they were blocked off, that was one of the few benefits was that they didn't see that the rest of the world's bar was here and they thought their bar was, was up here. So, and then when they've opened up to the world, the rest of us are like, Oh my God, I didn't know you could be that good at music. So <laughs> it's the same with the Russians with whether it could be ballet or figure skating or, or accordion uh, and piano. And, you know, the bar is just so high. Or, or especially in Asian and, 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 and China's now China's gotten into accordion and China's ability with accordion is way up here. They can't improvise to save their life. But yeah. in terms of classical playing and technique, it's, I mean, forget it. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> they're getting into pool. I, I like to play pool and China. They have some phenomenal, again, they're, they're just taking over a lot of things. But, hey, they're working hard for it. You know, they're they are. Yeah, the time. Yes. <clears throat> you know, that's kind of funny that you mentioned that, uh, the uh, Eastern Bloc countries like like cut off from the world. So in, in a in a detached way. So mm. Jerry Sigler, who who became my god on on the accordion, uh, uh, and trained me in Chicago. Here he's originally from Cleveland, and when he was younger, he would take a bus, a Greyhound, once a month to Chicago to study with Leon Sash. Okay. Yep. Now for those of you who don't know, Leon was blind, so Jerry told me. The first time he had a lesson with Leon, he goes, to, he gets to Leon's house and Lee's, Leon's wife, Lee Morgan, who was a wonderful lady, uh, says, okay, Leon's down in the basement. So Jerry walks down in the basement. It's pitch black. Okay. There's no lights on because Leon's blind and Jerry sits down and Leon's like, okay, set up your music or whatever. Let me hear you play. And Jerry's like, wait a minute. It's pitch black. I can't, he's thinking this. I can't play in this. It's it's pitch black. But, but then he's thinking, but I can't say anything to the guy because he's totally blind. So <laughs> it, it just shows that you can't let. So in essence, uh, the Eastern Bloc countries were in, in a way blind to what the rest of the world was doing. So they just reached levels that they thought were where they need to be. Same with Leon and other great blind musicians. Um well, our Tatum wasn't totally blind, but he was blind enough, you know, George Shearing. George and, wasn't you know, George Shearing. It was just at the same time we say George right. Shearing, of course. Let, Lenny Tristano, <laughs> another Italian. Lenny you Tristano, know. yeah. But, yeah. you know, so it's... The, the, I the think Matt Matthews was blind too, wasn't he? Matt Matthews. I thought, Jazz I thought so, player? yeah. Um, yeah. I got an interesting Matt Matthews story I'll tell you in a second, but <laughs> the only handicap that prevents you from get, accomplishing anything is the handicap that you put on yourself. OK, mm -hmm. anything else can be overcome. Now, this Matt Matthews thing. So Leon. OK, in America, we have this NAM show. And I know that Corey. I go every year. <laughs> yes, Corey's, Corey can talk a little bit more about that. But years ago, this is before my time. Leon was the was the king. He was considered at that time the best jazz accordionist in the world. And Matt, Matt, Matt Matthews came gunning for Leon at this NAM show. OK, Matt Matthews was going to cut Leon. And uh, I've, I've talked to six people who were there. After about 45 seconds, Matt Matthews took his accordion off, put it in the case, shut his case, and walked away because he got blown off the mat, man. There was no <laughs> way that – I mean, you're going to throw down a challenge to Leon Sash back then. Sash was the first accordionist technically to play at uh, um, Newport Jazz Festival. And I think I think Angelo played either there or, or uh, Storyville or something, but – but anyway, tell us about NAM and, and explain the background about NAM. And it's a big thing to be playing at NAM. 
It is. I, I got to play there on the outdoor stage last year, and they're supposed to have me on the, the full main stage outside next year. Um, but NAM is, it's funny because you go there to meet all kinds of musicians, but it's not an event for musicians at all. It's an event for music merchants. It's the National Association of Music Merchants. It's there for companies to show off new products to people who will sell products. But to help sell those products, you need top musicians to play and demonstrate those products. So it ends up becoming a hang for musicians. Uh, it's in L.A. every year, usually in January, but they pushed it. They didn't have it in 2021. And in 2022, they had it in June because they had to push it back for, the, for COVID. Next year, they'll have it in April because they can't go to January immediately. They need more time for companies to create stuff. So they'll go April next year, and then they'll go back to January in 2024. But it's a really big hang. You meet tons of people there. I, I got to finally play and hang with Joey DeFrancesco oh. at this NAM, And it's so devastating. We became really good buddies. He was going to have me in this band that he was going to have all people that can play bass. And he said, I changed his opinion on accordion because I was playing bass the whole time. Mm -hmm. So he's like, you'll be perfect for this band because Joey played sax, trumpet, and drums almost as well as he played jazz organ. And we all know he was arguably the greatest jazz organ player of all time. Yep. Uh, and he was a freak of nature. So he wanted a band where he could jump around instruments and people could keep playing the bass. Um, so it, it just utterly devastating to me, both as a musician and now as someone that got to know him, that he is gone at 51 years old and he looked amazing. And I tell you, he was playing better than he's ever played. I swear to God, he was absolutely playing out of his mind. Um, but but you got to meet people like this and, and you know, talk to them. Stevie Wonder goes every year. A lot of people that have become big on YouTube in the music world, they have big followings. They're all, always there all the time. So I highly recommend if you go to NAMM show, it's very cool. And you get to see products that are not out in the real world yet. And you get to meet amazing musicians and, and see them play. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of like a secret code. It's like, if you're a real musician out there playing, you know what the NAMM show is. If you don't, it's like, dude, how do you not know what the NAMM show is? Yeah. <laughs> so. That's interesting. Cause I guess many years ago, it used to be held in Chicago. Chicago had a lot of conventions and then, you know, things. Changed. You say Chicago so much like someone from Chicago. By yeah, the way. Right. Well, I've been here 30 years. Chicago. Man, you know? <laughs> I've been here how long now? 35 years. I've been out in Chicago, but you know what? The, the thing is. And I want the, the people here who are listening, and, and I'm sure that there none of them know anything about accordion. This guy is at the at the, at the pinnacle of it. I mean, Corey is he's you, you can equate him to any champion martial artist. Um, and 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 Corey, your versatility is I think something that is is overlooked in the general uh, you know consensus. Uh, you're not an accordionist. You're a musician, and, and that's the difference. Well, I, I always try to teach it as such. I say I'm trying to teach you or myself as to be the best musician possible who plays an instrument that happens to be called the accordion. I was I never wanted to be the best accordionist because I couldn't. I was never going to beat all these other guys. So I, I you try to find a path you think you can actually become of the best at. And, yeah, versatility is really what I, I try to be. I want to be able to play as many genres as possible authentically, not just to be able to play them, but to be able to play them. I'm about to play in another 28 minutes. I got to play an hour show here, all Italian music. It'll be all Italian. Um, you know, I might throw in a jazz number too that Sinatra did because in the Italian world, anything Sinatra touched, we consider kind of Italian. It's kind of funny. <laughs> so um, Anything you touched or do Italian. So I love, and then I'll do a French concert. I'll do a full on jazz concert. I can play a classical concert. I play lots of tango. I play Eastern European stuff. I play more klezmer than I play anything. And I'm not Jewish, but I play all klezmer music. Uh, so there's I play with rock bands. I play with DJs. I play electronic stuff with them. Uh, if you study theory and just study, study stuff, you, you can play all this. You just have to really study the authenticity of the style. Um, too many accordion players, they do this. They'll play La Vie and Rose poorly and they'll be like, I play French music. Or they'll play a Frank Morocco arrangement of all of me and be like, I play jazz. It's like, yeah, right. no, you don't. You <laughs> it's a shame you have to get rolling to this other gig, but I, because we'll talk privately whenever you have free time. Because I want to ask you if you know a few people, because I've been out of the world, the, the accordion world for a long time. And I'm getting, you know, I'm back trying to get back in it, but 
I've heard some sensational players on eBay, on uh, not on eBay, on uh, on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, right. I heard, right? <laughs> so I mean, but it, it it's it's fantastic. Um, but yeah, I hope people are picking stuff up from Corey that when even when you're at the highest levels, you're 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 just beginning still. Your 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 journey still keeps going. It doesn't end. It, you know, it's a never ending journey when you're when you're in love with something. Like Corey loves music. I love music or fighting and everything. And Corey loves his motorsports. Oh man, next time, if you ever come back on again, we got to talk about motorsports, you know, and oh man. I, I can talk motorsports till the cows come home twice. That's like, that, that is my, I'll be up tonight watching the Singapore Grand Prix, of course. Uh, I'm probably going to be going to the uh, Austin US Grand Prix. So yeah, I'm I'm nuts for for motorsport, completely nuts for it. I Joe's going to be up tonight watching something from Singapore or whatever. Where's that Asian? Yeah, that's porn, porn movies. But where are they from? What country in Asia, Joe? I try not to distinguish against any country. I have no bias. <laughs> Wherever I can get that from, I'm fine with. So they're all created equal. All porn, honestly, in my idea. Um, I did want to kind of i know corey's got to wrap it up and i'm kind of angry because i had like a million questions and i keep oh uh, well, that's awesome awesome <laughs> well, i was watching again going back and i highly recommend people hunt down your uh, your tedx talk but one of the things that's interesting um about your, your chosen instrument you talked about how kind of i don't know how else to describe it but in a lot of ways you know the peak of, of the accordion you know, it was many years ago. And so part of your life's work or one of your, your goals here is to reintroduce that and kind of, could you talk about kind of how you've had a, the different approaches you've had to try and reintroduce this, you know, what a lot of people kind of thought was an instrument of yesteryear, kind of antiquated, you know, and had even some stigma to it, you know? Um, oh, it has a massive, massive stigma. And and the people that try to say, oh, according is coming back. I heard it on this. I heard it on that. It's not coming back. It's coming back as a caricature of itself. Anytime I see it on TV, it's a complete caricature of itself. It's not it's not that people want accordion. It's that they're having a French event. So they want an accordion to fit French. They're having an Italian wedding and they want an accordion to fit the Italian. It's not like guitar where people say, get me a band. And that means guitar, drums, bass. You know, they don't they're not looking for the feel of a guitar. They just want a band that means guitar. But it, every country is different. So literally border to border, every country is different. So right now, according is as popular as ever in Brazil, in Mexico, Argentina, Scandinavia, France, Russia, China, Eastern Europe, as we talked about. Um, in Italy, it's the same as America, where your grandfather played accordion. You don't. Really? Um, yeah. Everybody thinks Italy accordion is popular. Incorrect. Yeah. If I if I go to a bar in Italy and see a pretty girl and think I'm going to impress her by saying I play accordion, she's going to say my grandfather plays. <laughs> it is not the case in France. Yes. Not in Italy. Um, in Austria, it's kind of still grandpa, uh, maybe dad. It's a little closer. Mm. Um, so every country is different. I'm trying to reintroduce it here with the electric accordion because young people do go nuts when I play all this stuff, even though electric accordion has been around since 1959, it's just, it, it hasn't been seen. It just hasn't been seen. So I, that's my whole work. My whole life goal is to try to make the accordion popular in America. And it's very difficult, um, because it just has that stigma to it, but you know, trying to figure all that stuff out but that's oh god that that could be an hour discussion on on the accordion stigma and uh my music will be in the new weird al movie i can say that we're getting close enough so you, oh, you no i can shit. premiere it here so if you go see the weird al movie you will hear my playing in that movie awesome. uh and, I'm, and i mentioned in the credits so that's that's very cool um but but yeah i'm trying it's it's a quest let me tell you it's a quest oh man that's great to hear about we're oh, cool thing man yeah. <laughs> well, at least you're not the bagpipes. That's what I can say as far as the accordion. Well, because the thing is, the accordion, I'm sorry, is the greatest instrument in the world. It's not even a debate. It's just yep. not. You can play 15 notes at the same time, which is more than a piano or a guitar. And also you have control of the volume at every millisecond, which the guitar and piano cannot do. It has oh, we lost you.
No, 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 no. I know someone's trying to go. So it is the best of both worlds. There's no, and it's portable, and it's portable. portable. So um, there's no instrument in the world like it. It's, it's. I, I actually made it because I'm a stat guy. I love graphs. I made a whole chart about this of all the details of instruments, and the accordion just comes out so far and away. But it's, it's unfortunately still laughed at a bit in America, especially the people that run the world, the people that run entertainment, run television, yeah. run TV you know any kind of commercial segments they still kind of laugh at the accordion and i'm always fighting that um and showing what the accordion can do but it's a it's a long quest but uh, yeah we're gonna we're gonna have to have a part two we talk about other stuff yeah and we're going we're gonna definitely do that because uh but one one thing you don't have to elaborate just a simple yes or no answer we can talk about this offline do you know emmanuel rastelli i know that name i definitely okay. know that name all right yeah because yeah. Yeah, he was. I think he was in the world championships. He may have won it. He Rid it play ridiculous piano accordion player. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. He's incredible. Yep, yep. Yeah, I don't know anything about him, but he he had mentioned once or something about Angelo de Pippo. But you know, because anyway, but I got to tell you, this is for me. This has been the most pleasurable uh, uh, podcast because well, it's an honor. It's an honor. My God, are you kidding me? It's an honor for for, for us. I mean, this I can't keep I keep talking like a kid. But the, the fact of the matter is, this guy's a legend. This is somebody that I look up to in his playing. And I'm 20 years older than him or something like that, 22 years older. But it don't matter. You, you get your inspirations from wherever. And I can relate when Corey was saying, you know, like, oh, that, you know, my grandfather played that, you know, plays the accordion and stuff. I went up to a girl not too long ago, young, real pretty. She says, oh, what's your cologne? And I told her, she says, oh, my dad wears the same cologne. So I get it, Corey. You're not alone in the world, okay? Even us great smellers have to suffer sometimes because of the youth of today. But <laughs> um, no, all kidding aside, man, we'd love to have you back on. Joe, do you have any last questions for Corey? Because I could talk to him all night long. Well, yeah, that's the trouble. It's like each category, I feel like I, I could start off on a whole other train of like discussion. Um, I mean, because yeah, I would want to dig more into like, you know, we kind of glossed over, we talked about all the highlights of your career, but I'd love to dig into like, well, what does it actually take to get to that national championship? Right. What were you, what were you like, what was your life as a kid? I mean, I don't like, I don't know how much time we have here, but how many hours were you putting in? What was it like, you know, what, give us, maybe try and give us a window into that. Maybe as the parting like topic. I, I mean, I'm terrible with that. I literally practiced an hour a day. That's it. Really? <laughs> an hour a day. Yeah. One. Wow. One hour. <laughs> I hated practicing. I was a, I had video games to play. <laughs> I played way more video games than I played accordion. So wow. no, one hour. That that's really it. Um, so you must. I don't know. I don't know how. Natural affinity, probably. It sounds like. Well, I mean, no. I actually think, and this is another. Maybe I'll do a TED talk on this when I research it more. I think there's something to video games with because it's the same brain to finger independence when you when you go to video games. I think it's the same thing. So I think I, there's some tie into that. So was, that could be another very topic. true. I bet you that's very true that 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 neurological pathways are being built, you know, that hand. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting idea. Um, yeah. Uh, gosh, yeah. I don't know what else to ask. So more. So oh. play more video games, kids. That's the lesson. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, do please, please, kids, do not listen to the end of this part. Please don't listen to this part. Of yeah. Any of you children <laughs> that want to enter med school, don't bother with it. Just practice video games, and you know, you'll be able to do brain surgery. Don't worry. Exactly. Maybe, maybe get that game operation. That's also very yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I will. Uh, let's talk soon, guys. And I'll. I got to run to the stage. <laughs> yeah, it's been an honor, man. We'll keep in touch. You know, knock them dead tonight, man. Break a leg yeah. and. Uh, We'll be talking to you real soon, Corey. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much. This was awesome. Good okay. luck. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye. Don't, don't thank, you, thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, buddy. <laughs> keep, keep, keep the, all right. So thank keep you, thank us you. going for a moment because, uh, oh, Melody left. Yeah, but, that's uh, me and you now, bud. Okay. Yeah, well, she... I just wanted to kind of wrap it up uh, because a little synopsis again, th this is interesting because I'm probably the only martial art guy or, you know, what we do self-defense oriented that, that, I mean, I'm not the only guy that did the music, but the, the jazz and the high level jazz. And, you know, you can hear from Corey, there is correlations, there are tie-ins and, and really I can't disagree with anything he said about the, the development of the brain and the thought process and, 
and learning to improvise, putting it all together. And, and his connection about how classical players can't imp generally, he's speaking generally, you know, can't improvise, can't change keys, can't do that. And, and that's, the, that's what I've been fighting for 25, 30 years in the martial arts world. Don't become a robot because the minute you get out of that, that world, you're doomed and, and fighting should be improvising. That's why, that's why what I teach is so different, I believe, than anything anybody else teaches because it's that learning to improvise. And I can't wait to have Corey back on some more to talk about techniques, like the actual finger exercises. And he's non-conventional. It doesn't sound to me like he really did the true classical repertoire, uh, not repertoire, but the, uh, well, we'll get it from him. We'll figure out what he's doing. But uh, it was just great to have him on because, you know, and he's so jovial. I wish this guy a lot of success. Don't you? Oh, absolutely. And just I, I kind of mentioned it at the beginning of the podcast of, you know, here's a world class. You know, if you and I tried to call up some major league baseball player or somebody, you know, I'm just trying to think or whoever, some yeah. some big name MMA fighter. You know, it's very likely we'd have to talk to a couple of people and they might give us, you know, be on the phone. This guy is just so personable, so happy to give. I mean, he it, clearly he he loves talking about it and loves getting the word out there. Um, so it was just it was very. Um, yeah, just it's such a great experience. And I'm so happy. I hope that this podcast helps promote his music and helps get people out there and not only promote the according in general, but like his specific because um yeah, just a great guy. I mean, really impressed. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm so happy that we're using this as a platform to kind of uh, give some exposure to him and to that area. Because I know we've talked course, about put, it. Put, put all his information down, get it from him. And, you know, I want to pick his brain and get some some tips on, on playing and, uh, you know, ideas, you know, chords and, you know, how, you know his thoughts on, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. I want to pick his brain from a technical standpoint. Um, because you're never, you know, you're never too old to learn. And, uh, and he's, he, you know, he's got a lot to offer, not, and not just an accordion player, a musician in general, <clears throat> excuse me, in general. And that's how we are as, as fighters. We're not, we, we got to get past this stylistic shit. Okay. Where I'm a Kung Fu guy, or I'm a wrestler, or I'm a BJJ guy or Taekwondo, you know, it's a bigger, it's a bigger community. And, you know, uh, you, you've got to start swapping and, and, and developing and, and Corey's, you know, uh, Corey's doing it, you know, he's, he's really, uh, you know, quite accomplished and he's coming around at a time or he, his competition days were when in Europe and in, in, uh, in Europe, especially Eastern blocks and everything, they were dominating these world titles, you know, and Italy too, back then, um, so he was stacked. The deck was stacked against him. You know, he was up against a hard, a hard nut to crack. Um, but he went for it, and uh, no, you know, no regrets. It sounds like. But anyway, guys, we've been going out for a bit. I guess we should wrap it up. Um, Joe, at least Joe and I will be here next week. We might have Martin next week as well. Again, Martin, uh, his wife is still out of town, so he's doing the, the Mister Mom thing. He's watching his two two kids, but. Um, Anyway, yep, the seminars are coming up. And once again, if you guys want to do the three or five day training or or some other like try C thing, you know, reach out to me, please, while we have the time, while I have the the the, the time. Um, and we're gonna go from there. But um, Joe, what are your parting words? Well, the only other thing is like my big takeaway was uh Corey's humility. Here's a guy on top of the, the you know, his chosen field, and he's like, Oh, here's the other guys that are great that are better than me, and I need to learn more. You know, and, and um, so that was a big takeaway that that, you know, life, it's a it's a truly an infinite journey. If you he says, you know, when you say I think he said, if you say you're good, you're done. And I really like that, that you got to stay humble and keep working at it. Um, and so I, I really took away a lot of uh, really inspiration from him. So it was a, you know, fascinating talk. And yeah, I was really I'm really happy with this episode. So thank you. And remember, too, you know, he he's gone outside the accordion world to, to develop more other jazz players, different musician, uh, you know, musical instruments and so on. And once again, that's a lesson for martial artists. Don't get married to your martial arts style. There are, there are other avenues that you can learn from. Like I did not learn just one thing. Okay. I learned to box wrestle, you know, submissions, 
kicking, you know, self-defense, do it. You know, just there's too much um, tribalism, I think. And the accordion world's like that. If you notice in the earlier thing, Corey was saying he was getting bashed big time in the accordion world. Okay. Um, you didn't really win a world title like, you know, the, the Russians and all that. Um, so what? He, you know, he persevered through it and he, he expanded his horizons and, and it wasn't a, it, it, it wasn't a roadblock. It was more or less like just a little detour. Okay. And he just went around the obstacles and, and, and he's succeeding. So those of you in the martial arts world, don't feel afraid to branch out. Okay. Because all great musicians have, have played with other great musicians. And some of the guys who loved jazz that I know personally were phenomenal jazz players will tell you they weren't good enough because they didn't have the opportunity to go on the road or they weren't on the road long enough to play with other jazz musicians to take their level, which, which I thought was fantastic already, to another level. They couldn't do it because they weren't given the opportunity to be around other premier players where you're bouncing ideas off in a non-competitive situation. I think that's another big thing here. When you're gigging, it's not a competition, okay? Um, it's a friendly rivalry maybe, but it, it's not, you're not out to fucking crush, crush your, your, your fellow sidemen. You're there to make the whole group sound better. And that's what needs to be in a gym situation, a martial arts situation. The gym, the, the gym has to become the bandstand where everybody gets better. OK, when you're not just beating somebody down mentally or physically, the whole the whole avenue gets better um, or the whole venue, I meant to say. But anyway, that's my little closing rant. I hope to see everybody here next week. And to my newfound friends on the uh, the accordion forum, I didn't I don't want to give the web address because I didn't ask for permission. But um, anyway. It was great to have Corey. Great to see you. Great to see Melody. We didn't get to say goodbye, but, you know, we'll see her soon. All right. Goodbye, Coach. See ya.